So if you're here last week, we did begin this series kind of on the prosperity gospel, and we uh, talked about uh, where this movement comes from and some of the things they believe. We're not going to get into that again today. Uh, I tried my best just to stay factual and to quote uh, people directly, and I hope that was accomplished uh, last week. And so over the next three weeks, I, I actually just want to address the three main claims of the prosperity gospel, and that is the belief that health, wealth, and prosperity are all guaranteed for believers in Jesus and are always God's will for our lives. And so as I talk about the false hope of guaranteed healing this morning, I want to talk about healing, but once again, I want to emphasize the fact that God can and does still heal today, right? We have it in our bulletin. We have requests in our prayer chain, right? If we didn't believe God healed today, we wouldn't pray. So this isn't a series against the charismatic gifts or a debate on which gifts are in effect or which aren't. What we want to address this in this month is, is the word faith movement, where the prosperity gospel comes from. And this is a movement that teaches perfect health is a guarantee for every believer in Jesus. So here's the thing. If that is true, fantastic. Let's figure out how it works and get all of you healthy. Really, if that's true, let's, let's get it done. But if it's not, we need to reject what this movement is saying, and then we need to adjust our thinking about sickness and health so that it lines up with the Bible. And so today, I finally want to get into some more scripture here, and I want to sort of, sort of try to debunk some of the famous verses used, and there's many we could use, I just picked kind of the main ones, that are used by this movement to so-called, supposedly prove their doctrine, okay? So, there's three major beliefs that we're going to address this morning, and I'm going to try my best to explain them and, and debunk them as best as I can. So the first belief in the word faith movement is this idea that healing is part of the atonement, that perfect health and healing is part of the atonement. I mean atonement as far as the death of Jesus on the cross. Okay, so the word of faith movement believes that the death of Jesus on the cross not only provides forgiveness of sins, but also freedom from sickness, and disease. And so perfect health is actually a key part of the gospel in the word faith movement. Let me read you a quote here from Oral Roberts, who I don't think he's even alive anymore. If he is, he's very old. He said this in 1976. Just to sort of establish the point of this is what they believe. Here's what he says, quote, for the knowledge of the truth, look towards Jesus of Nazareth, who himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. If Jesus took our sicknesses, we need not bear them any longer. Sickness is part of the curse, and Jesus came to destroy the curse. He suffered in our stead because he did not want us to suffer disease. Okay, is that true? He took our specific diseases and infirmities upon his own sinless, perfect body in complete payment for the penalty of sin. I know it is God's highest wish for you to be in health. Sickness is not part of God's plan and not devised by God's will. Okay? So what are some of the main verses that are used to prove this point? Well, Isaiah 53, 5 is a big one. And then, of course, 1 Peter 2, 24, which quotes the same verse. I won't have on the screen, but we'll talk about it here in a minute. Here's what it says. But he was wounded for our transgression, speaking of Jesus. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Okay? And another one, which I think is fairly more significant and a little bit harder to maybe discuss, is this one, Matthew 8, 16 to 17. Keep in mind, though, if you're building a doctrine off of one or two verses, and 2,000 years of church history has never had this belief, you need to question it. Here's what it says. When evening had come, <clears throat> they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Okay? Now, let's talk about these verses as best as we can, explain what do I think these verses are actually saying. Because they would say, that's proof that you should be healthy, Never be sick. <clears throat> well, Isaiah 53, of course, 
If you, re- if you know your Bible, is this really incredible prophecy about the coming of Jesus, what he would do for us on the cross. Right? It calls Jesus a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. It says that he would be despised and beaten and killed. And really, I think the main point of the passage seems to be that this Messiah who was coming was going to bear our sins and would, would actually be made an offering for sin. Very interesting. 700 years before Jesus, this is predicted, prophesied, by the way. And then in verse 5, we're told, told the wounds and bruises of Jesus were for our iniquities and transgressions. In other words, because of our sin. And then it says, right at the end of the verse, by his stripes we are healed. Again, so that's proof that we're all supposed to be healthy. You read all, all of Isaiah 53, and you're, you're, you're reading the context. I believe very strongly the context of the chapter has nothing to do with physical healing. It's all about our sin being placed on Jesus and him suffering and dying in our place so that we could be forgiven. Okay, if you have your Bible, I'm sorry I don't have it on the screen, 1 Peter 2, 24. If you start in verse 21, I can hear all the Bibles opening. I, I can hear it. <laughs> okay. I just want to read this for you because, again, he quotes this verse again. But let's look at the whole passage in context. I think we're going to find it's very clearly not speaking about physical healing. 1 Peter 2, beginning in verse 21. 1 Peter is all about suffering believers who need to endure. He says this, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile in return, when he suffered he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. Is there anything about physical sickness or healing so far? Nothing. By whose stripes you were healed. For, that's connecting it to the previous verse, for you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Okay, so the context of this chapter, believers are suffering. He's calling us to look at the suffering of Jesus to follow in his footsteps. And he's sort of liberally quoting from Isaiah 53 here. Verse 22 and verse 25 are both quotes uh, partially from Isaiah 53. And then at the end of verse 24, he uses that same statement, by whose Stripes, you were healed. Okay, why does Peter bring up this verse? What does he think Jesus has healed us from? Read verses 24 and 25 again. I can see two ways we have been healed by Jesus, according to these verses, and neither of them are physical health. First, he says, because Jesus died for us, that we now have died to our sins so that we might live for righteousness. There's an idea of freedom from sin there. And finally, in verse 25, he actually quotes Isaiah 53 again and says that we were all like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. What do either of those things have to do with physical healing? And the answer is nothing. Nothing. So what healing have we received in the context of what Peter is saying? One, that we have become free from sin. We'll talk about that in Romans chapter 6 this fall when we get back into Romans. And secondly... He says that we have now been reconciled to God. And so the healing that Peter is talking about here in chapter 2 is spiritual and relational, not physical. You guys see what I'm trying to say? You know, years ago, I had a pastor in Portage. I was a friend with him, but we disagreed on many things. He was heavily into the word faith movement. He opened his Bible up to 1 Peter 2.24, and he says, By his stripes we are healed, Kevin. What does this verse mean? And so when I took my Bible, if I can find it here, And I began flipping to another page. He said, no, no, stop. He says, you can't go anywhere else. You can't even read the verses before or after. Just verse 24, what does it mean? Well, that's how you interpret the Bible. You're going to think about a lot of strange things. That is not how we interpret Scripture, amen? There's a context. When you build an entire theology off of one isolated verse while ignoring context, man, that's how cults start, in my opinion. Okay, so again, I think Peter and and Isaiah are very much talking about spiritual and relational healing, not physical healing. Now, this this verse in Matthew is a little bit more difficult because he actually makes the statement that he bore our sicknesses. That seems to sort of establish what they're trying to say. 
But let's take a closer look at the verse. I'm going to read it again. Then look at the beginning of verse 17. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out spirits with the word and healed all who were sick. Verse 17, that it might be fulfilled. When was this fulfilled? At that very moment, that's present tense, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying, and then he finishes the statement. When was the prophecy fulfilled? At this moment when Jesus is casting out demons and healing people. Was Jesus dying for our sins on the cross in Matthew chapter 8? So you can't say this first means there's healing in the atonement when the atonement doesn't happen until chapter 26, chapter 27. The author is bringing in this prophecy from Isaiah to show that Jesus is indeed the Messiah, that the fact that he can heal people is proof of who he is. You can't base an entire theology off of one verse. One, one, uh, one uh, commentator said this, and he, he agrees with this interpretation, just so you know it's not me, just me. Here's what he said, quote, Jesus was not actually bearing sin in Matthew 8, right? He's not on the cross yet, but he was bearing some of the consequences of sin. Thus, Jesus showed himself to be the true Messiah prophesied by Isaiah. In healing the multitudes of their physical ailments, Jesus proved his power to also heal them of their spiritual ailments, which are actually much worse, right, than sickness. Matthew finds in the healing miracles of Jesus a foretaste of his atonement for sin. The bearing of the diseases was emblematic of the removal of sin. The ultimate cause of sickness, the sin of the world, would be born later on the cross, and our ultimate physical healing with resurrection will come at the end. I believe in ultimate physical healing, but it's not here on the earth. It, of course, is when we get to go be with the Lord forever. Okay, so if this verse is saying anything, maximum would be that we have healing in heaven. But I don't think we can base the whole theology just off this verse. And again, the miracles of Jesus always serve a higher purpose. He wants people to see who he is. Right? Okay, one final thought on this idea of healing being in the, in the atonement. Okay, we don't have to understand everything perfectly as far as what I just shared, but there are sort of logical conclusions we can reach that don't make any sense if you believe this. Okay? Here's a thought. If healing really is part of the atonement, part of the death of Jesus on the cross, then there are multitudes of Christians, I would say the majority of them, most of them, who have never received this so-called healing that Jesus has purchased for them. One author explains it very well when he said this. And I think this is the logical conclusion we have to reach. He said this, quote, If healing is in the atonement, to the same extent as salvation, then one possesses salvation to the extent he enjoys physical health. But since all Christians in the past have died, and mostly from disease, this would prove that all had lost salvation, for all surely lost health. It's part of the atonement. People get sick and die, and we all do. It doesn't seem to make any sense. And so if healing is part of the atonement, and you remain sick, what does that say about your eternal salvation? Interesting thought. The second point here in word faith theology is the belief that healing is a guarantee for all believers. Benny Hinn said this, quote, There will be no sickness for the saint of God. <clears throat> if your body belongs to God, it does not and cannot belong to sickness. And so because healing is in the atonement, the word faith teachers would say that your physical health is just as much yours as your eternal salvation is. But the Bible really seems to indicate that this isn't true. We'll get to that in a minute. Put aside the fact that this guaranteed healing stuff doesn't even happen or work in the real world, even for the word faith guys teaching it, by the way. If we can show from Scripture that healing didn't always happen back then at the peak of the apostolic era, I think it calls into question this belief of guaranteed healing. Here's some verses I'll share. I, I underline the important part for you. 2 Timothy 4.20, he says this, Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. <clears throat> Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. Question for you to consider. If healing is a guarantee for all believers, why did Paul leave his friend in Miletus 
and, and this is Paul we're talking about. He has recorded healings in the book of Acts. He would give little handkerchiefs and people would get healed just by touching them. And yet this guy isn't healed. Could it be that it isn't always God's will to heal? <clears throat> Another verse, 1 Timothy 5.23, <clears throat> giving his young pastor friend advice. He says this, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and for your what? Frequent infirmities. So, of course, Timothy sent to Ephesus, a difficult church. Probably was just stressed out and feeling sick in the stomach. Maybe the water wasn't good. I don't know. But again, another question. Why didn't Paul just go and heal Timothy? Or why didn't Timothy just heal himself? And by the way, he's giving health advice here. Do this so you'll feel better. Why would somebody with a healing gift give health advice? Wouldn't you just heal him? Could it be that healing is not a guarantee for every Christian and that sometimes we can ask God for healing and he can say no? Again, in prosperity theology, God never says no to your prayers for healing. You just don't get it because you don't have enough faith. We'll get to that. We read this already, but I'll read it again. Great example of healing not being a guarantee. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 12, unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest on me. Now, there's some debate about what this thorn actually was, but I think the fact that he calls it a thorn in the flesh tells me it's a physical ailment of some kind. We don't know what it was. There's no doubt in my mind that this was a physical pain, sickness, ailment of some kind. This is a verse that the prosperity gospel folks can't answer. Because this is what the verse just said. Paul cries out to God three times for this ailment to be removed, for him to be healed. And three times God says what? No. No. This verse is proof that God has the sovereign authority as our creator to say no to any request, including requests for healing. And if Paul, who is an apostle, who wrote half of the New Testament, who had the spiritual gift of healing, could not heal himself, if he asked God to heal him and God said no, that puts a nail in the coffin of the prosperity gospel. Dead as a doornail. Amen? Dead as a doornail. How do you say healing is guaranteed when Paul couldn't even heal himself? I had a friend in this movement years ago. He'd say, well, that was just Paul. All right. We're also told, by the way, there's a very important reason why God would not heal him. He, he let him have this illness to keep God humble. That's also opposite of the word of faith. They would say, God never used the sickness to discipline us or to teach us anything. Man, and think of it. If, if, if Paul would have been healed of this thorn, he wouldn't have written that portion of 2 Corinthians and there, are, there have been millions of believers over the, over the centuries that have, been, that, that have received encouragement from this verse that God's grace is sufficient. So God had a very important purpose in allowing him to be ill the way he was. Okay, so there's, there's many more verses we can give. It's clear, I think, from Scripture, healing is not a guarantee for every believer in Jesus. Okay, it's obvious, of course, that we get sick. The word faith teachers get sick. Kenneth Copeland, just this past week, they had a big conference. He was saying all the same things he usually does. One thing he revealed, he's almost 80 years old now, he revealed to his audience that he has, he has recently gotten a pacemaker installed in his chest. Okay? Stop and think about that for a second. You're standing on the stage teaching healing is a guarantee for every believer, but you have an object in your chest that keeps you alive. Anyone else have an issue with that? Why the crowd didn't get up and leave the moment he said that, I don't know. Okay. Sometimes the most obvious answer is the obvious answer. Finally, another point in this theology, and this is, I think, some of the more dangerous points, this actually hurts and affects people, destroys their faith, the belief that if you are sick, it's because you don't have enough faith. So think it through logically. Jesus died for your healing. 
Therefore, it's a guarantee for every believer. Are you with me so far? Okay. What happens when a sick person prays for healing, but that healing never comes? We all know people we prayed for their healing and they passed away. We wonder why. Well, all the word faith movement can say, that person must not have had enough faith. There is no thought given as to the sovereignty of God or the will of God over your situation. In word faith thinking, God has provided everything that you could ever need to be healed. And so you are at fault if you remain sick, again, because Jesus paid for your healing and you should be free from sickness. Can anyone else see how this can be discouraging for a sick person? In particular, someone who's chronically sick or dying? One author said this, healing does not fail because of the will of God, but because of the unbelief of his children. One other said this, the only thing in existence that can limit the power of the Lord Jesus Christ is our unbelief. <laughs> Let me read you a story that totally contradicts what I just read. You have your Bible, John 5. John 5, 1 to 15. I just want to read this to you. <clears throat> this story, um, I think, disproves a lot of things. Let me read it to you. Actually, a very strange story. <clears throat> Let me read it for you. After this, John 5, 1 to, I think, 15. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. You now, there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. This is a belief they had at the time. That's why they were there. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. And whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease they had. Or maybe that's just what they believe. I don't know for sure. Your, your NIV won't have that part, by the way. Now, a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. I'm 36. It's a long time. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? <laughs> Interesting question. <laughs> The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. Wow, quite the miracle. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Look at this. Then they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was. Interesting. For Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it, would Je that it was Jesus who had made him well. <laughs> so a couple of things in this verse are very interesting and contradict word faith theology very clearly. Here they are. Not enough faith? Really? Point one. Jesus healed only one man out of a multitude of people. Where was this man sitting, laying? On this balcony full of sick people. What does Jesus do? He walks in, looks at the one guy, says, do you want to be healed? Can you imagine the guy sitting beside him thinking, well, <laughs> I'd like to be healed too. What does Jesus do? Heals the one man and what? Walks out. Interesting. Again, if physical healing was the whole point of Jesus' ministry, clearly he failed on more than one occasion. That wasn't the point. Second, and this really blows it up here, the man who was healed didn't even have any faith. Why? He didn't even know who Jesus was until afterwards. How do you have faith in someone you don't even know? Again, this flies in the faith of word faith theology because they say you need sufficient faith to be healed. You need to build up your faith, fill up your faith, come to our conference, give us money. We'll talk more about that next week. In order to have enough faith to receive your miracle, and yet this man who doesn't even know who Jesus is gets healed by Jesus. Why? Because Jesus has the authority to heal and to do whatever he wants, and he proves here in this passage that he doesn't need help from our faith to heal us. Amen? He doesn't need our help. He made the world with a speaking a word. Do you think he needs my faith to heal me? And finally, this man was healed instantly. All healings recorded in the New Testament that I know of, healing was always instant and complete. 
Not temporary, not halfway done, not lost if I lose my faith. See, this is what the word faith teachers say. You've been healed, but make sure you keep your faith. Why would he say that? Because the person's not actually healed. And then the person dies. Well, he must not have had enough faith. He didn't hang on. Very dangerous. How many pastors have had to bury people who were told they were healed but were lied to and were not? Many, many, many. Here's the thing, folks. We don't always know why healing doesn't come. And it hurts when we pray for somebody and God doesn't heal them. It's hard. We don't get it. But it's cruel to tell someone that they remain sick because they don't have enough faith. Because we don't know the reason why. It could be they didn't have enough faith, but we don't know. We shouldn't claim to. What we should do is we minister to people who are suffering is to encourage them to rest in the goodness and the love and the sovereignty of God, that God is able to carry us through our difficulties and even teach us something about himself during those times of suffering, that his grace really is sufficient for us during those areas and times of weakness and suffering. But we will end up shipwrecking someone's faith when we blame their sickness and suffering on a lack of faith. Right? So dangerous. So dangerous. Okay, I want to share one final thing here before we close. I want to share some of the real-life consequences of believing in guaranteed healing. Because not only is this movement theologically incorrect, it's also um, incredibly cruel and has real-life uh, consequences. So I just have some stories here that I found. And I'm sorry if that died there. It's okay, my slides are done anyways. Just found some stories here of people who have gone to various healing conferences and just some of the horrible things that happened. It's a little bit graphic, but it's to show you how dangerous this belief is. Okay? And again, we don't preach like this all year. We're excited to get back into Romans in September, but once in a while we've got to cover things that are more difficult like this. Here's what's, what, what, one, what one person said. Quote, Apart from the damage which the miraculous healing movement is doing to the faith, it is a cruel teaching because by claiming all may be healed if they have sufficient faith, it increases the agony of many who are sick. He mentions this fellow named Don Double. I've never heard of him, but it's in his quote. This guy conducted a healing crusade. Mr. Double heals different ailments on different nights. And it so happened one night he was healing the deaf. And so one night he'll heal blind people. The next night he'll, he'll, he'll heal cancer or whatever. And a friend of mine who was deaf in one ear thought he would have a go at being healed. And so hands were laid upon him and he was told that he was healed, but he said, I'm not. Like, I, I still can't hear in my ear. The healer said, yes, you are. My friend insisted, no, I'm not. Only to be told, well, it must be that you don't have enough faith. After a, after a brief altercation, the healer went down the line of deaf people. When the healing activities had finished, my friend turned to the lady next to him and said, did it do anything for you? And she replied with her hand cupped her, to her ear and said, what did you say? Nobody was healed of their deafness. Okay. Almost a funny story. What? Didn't work. One author continues, it is, it is necessary to say that this miraculous healing teaching is not only damaging, it is often disastrous. What does he mean by uh, miraculous healing teaching? That it's a guarantee for us. Not that we don't pray for healing. He says this, I think of a general practitioner who was a great friend of mine, a fine Christian lady who had led many people to Christ, but she suffered from severe depression. Fortunately, her depression was controlled by medication. Her counseling ministry was one that I valued so much that I would often send my depressed patients to her, to her for help. Unfortunately, she fell in a group who majored on this miraculous healing teaching, and she was informed that she had been healed of her depression. She therefore abandoned her medication, but sadly, three weeks later, she hung herself. Real-life consequences to this belief. He, he, he continues, I think of another person, a girl, she had severe epilepsy. Fortunately, again, she was controlled on medication. She too fell in with a similar charismatic group, and likewise, she abandoned her medication. One day, she was traveling over to this particular city, stepped off the bus, had a major seizure, and fell under the wheels of an oncoming car to be killed outright. He finishes by saying this, I put the deaths of these two useful Christians firmly and squarely at the door of those who promoted such disastrous teaching. And I assert as strongly as possible that it is distressing, it is damaging, and it is dangerous to the extreme. I agree with what the authors just said there. And we can give you many, many, many stories. 
I've heard of small kids dying from lockjaw because parents refused to get them vaccinated for a disease that's preventable, okay? Many stories like this we could share. A lady in my last church, okay? Severe cancer. Now, I'm not going to get treated. I'm going to go get healed. Not doing so well. So not only is this word faith movement not true, it's dangerous. Real life, real world consequences. Again, when someone is told they are healed and yet remain sick or even die, that is devastating for that person and their family, right? When a person is told they are sick because they don't have enough faith, it is incredibly discouraging to that person because often the person is believing for a miracle as best as they can. When a person buys into the, into the prosperity gospel lie, they set themselves up to eventually shipwreck their faith because times of difficulty, suffering, and death will eventually come. And in that theology, you can only blame yourself for that suffering. There's, no, there's nothing else you can say. There is no comfort from God in word faith theology because you are the one not believing his promises for healing. So I think it's clear from scripture, healing is not a guarantee, nor is it part of the atonement. There are times where God will heal, praise God when he does, but there are many other times where he will choose not to. By the way, every single person, we read about that guy in John 5 that Jesus healed. What happened to that guy? Have you seen him down the street walking around anywhere? He's dead, isn't he? Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead. What happened to Lazarus eventually? He's dead. And actually, the funny part of the Lazarus story is Jesus has raised him back from the dead, and the Pharisees plot to kill him. That's kind of funny. Poor guy. I just got back to life, and these guys are trying to kill me. Here's the thing, folks. The Christian life, and this is hard as North Americans because we're all stuck in prosperity gospel to some extent. The Christian life isn't a pursuit of health, wealth, and success. And I'll add things like comfort and safety as well. This is what the world seeks after. Our life's goal and passion should be the pursuit of a person. And that person is who? Jesus. And when we have that relationship with him, we can walk through times of sickness and poorness and failure. Not because those times are easy, and they never are, but because God's grace is sufficient to meet my needs each day. And you know, as well as I do, the lessons you learn when you're sick and suffering are far higher than when you're doing well. Amen? You know that is true. When I'm healthy and I'm blessed and I'm doing good, I'm congratulating myself on a successful day. See, what the prosperity gospel sadly does is it robs a person out of finding their satisfaction in Christ alone. Because our relationship with Christ, as I said, almost always grows in times of suffering. Suffering that the word of faith movement says is not God's will for you. Here's the thing, and we're going to find this in Romans 8.28 when we get there someday. Everything God does or allows in our lives is meant to contribute towards one singular goal, and that is making you more like Jesus Christ. And so if God knows you being sick with something chronic is going to make you more like Jesus Christ, he might allow that into your life. Because that's the main goal, Romans 8, 28, in, your, in, in his mind for us. Suffering is one of the main tools in God's hands to help make us more like Christ. And so my only application for you today, other than just to be, to be careful who you're listening and reading, when times are tough, don't waste your suffering. Use those times to, to dig in and to draw close to the Lord. Don't believe the lie that God must not love you because you're suffering or God must not love you because you aren't being healed. It's the total opposite of that. Don't believe this, this must only be happening to me because I don't have enough faith. No, it's in those moments of immense pressure that God is forming Christ in you. And you will look back on those times, and you all know this is true, you will look back on those times and you'll say, wow, God really grew me during that time of sickness. God really grew me during that time of, of, of uh, relational disaster or whatever it was. I grew in my faith because I suffered. Amen? Very true. I would take growth in Christ's likeness over perfect health any time. How about you? Let's pray. And we have communion here together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love once again. Thank you, Lord, that ultimate healing is in heaven for us, that there is a day you're going to wipe every tear and there will be no sickness or pain or suffering of any kind. Um, we thank you at the times that you do heal us here on the earth, times where you do give us extra years in our lives. But thank you, Lord, that you are sovereign over all things and we are going to die exactly the time you want us to go. Help us to live for you 
whether we've got 30 more years, 40 more years, or whether we're going to die tomorrow morning, help us to live today for you because we don't know what tomorrow will bring. Father, as we get into communion now and, 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 and take some time before you, uh, getting right with you and getting right with each other, I pray that this communion time will be a blessing for us, um, that it wouldn't just be a, um, a traditional thing that we do that has no meaning, but that we would be deeply touched by what you're going to do in our hearts and lives here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.